<laughs> well, we're glad to see each of you here this morning. Uh, let me just read this note. Dear past Lawson and friends of NCBC, thank you for the wonderful anniversary service. We truly enjoyed the time of fellowship with new and old friends. And thank you so much for the gifts and the, and the special tribute to the founder, in quotes. Uh, we praise the Lord for you, uh, for you all and for the continuing ministry at NCBC. Uh, much love in our Lord, Pastor Sam and Jack, Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. So uh, he sent that note, and I wanted to just uh, share that with you. So come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast your poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Uh, so we miss Sydney. Yeah, we miss Sydney. That's for sure. All right, Deborah's going to read Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. We're going to cut the reading and pick up the reading next week um, of the rest of the chapter, with 12. Um, Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. Now the Lord said unto the Lord, had one language and one speech. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of China, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and, and, and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for water. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower, whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. These will be this will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now nothing that they prosper to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, this is named, therefore its name is called the Babel, because, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Amen. Thank you, Deb. So again, good morning, NCBC and friends. Uh, last week we considered the story of the nations and found out how Noah's three sons fulfilled God's command uh, of Genesis 9-1 uh, to be fruitful and multiply. This they did as we saw the descendants of Sham, Ham, and Japheth uh, in Genesis chapter 10 uh, last week. Um, but the descendants uh, of Sham, Ham, and Japheth failed to fulfill the third aspect of God's command in Genesis 9-1. That aspect was to fill the earth. So the story of the dispersion is the story of how that aspect of God's command was unwillingly fulfilled. And the story of this dispersion will be told with three emphases today, as you can see from the insert in your bulletin. Uh, we want to talk briefly about the will of God, the will of man, and the wrath of God. <clears throat> First, the will of God. God had expressed his will for the post-flood people in Genesis 9-1, so which says, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. 
Sham, Ham, and Japheth were fruitful, and they did multiply as Genesis 10 records through their descendants, but they did not fill the earth. They did not do all the will of God. Much like King Samuel, King, King Samuel, King Saul, who was told to uh, destroy all of the Amalekites and all that they had. And he allowed the king to live and he allowed the animals to live. And as a result, he lost his kingdom because he only partially obeyed God. And so it is today. Men do not do all the will of God. The question is, where does the will of God begin for all men on earth? And I want you to turn with me, if you would, please, to John's Gospel. John's Gospel and chapter 6. And briefly, I want to uh, read uh, two verses to you. Jesus is having a discussion with the Jews in his day. And uh, he had... Uh, Chapter 6 starts of John with Jesus feeding the 5,000. Then it goes to him walking on water. And then him giving uh, the first of the seven I am statements in John 6 where he said, I am uh, the bread of life. But in the midst of his discussion uh, with uh, the Jews, he says this. In verse 26, I'll just back up to 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most surely I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then verses 28 and 29. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Believe in him, believe in Christ, whom he, God the Father, sent. That's where the will of God starts for every person on planet Earth. God's will is for all men to repent and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 say this, quote, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The question is, what is the truth? Well, in verse 5 of 2 Timothy 2, Paul continues with this statement, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. What is the truth? The truth is that Jesus is God, manifested in the flesh. The truth is that Jesus died for sinners. The question is, do you agree with God that you are a sinner and have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You see, this is the will of God for all mankind, all seven billion people on the planet. This is where the will of God starts for everyone on planet Earth. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 5 8 says, God demonstrated his love for us in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 10 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The will of God for every person on the planet starts with salvation, with repenting of your sins, with acknowledging that you're a sinner, repenting of your sins, and by faith receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross. The Pope didn't die on the cross. The preacher didn't die on the cross. The prince and anyone else you can think of did not die on the cross. The church did not die on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. And you must repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is where the will of God starts. And unfortunately on planet earth today, of the 7 billion plus people, only 2 billion identify with Christ. 
That's less than half. And of the two billion that claim to be Christian, not all of them are Christian because Jesus said at the end of Matthew uh, chapter 7, when he was finishing the Sermon on the Mount, he says, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? And he says, depart from me, I don't know you. So there are many people who claim to be Christian who are not Christian. Because the Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. God knows those who belong to him. You can lie to yourself, you can lie to other people, but you cannot lie to God. God knows exactly who has received his son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. God knows exactly those who have repented of their sins, have agreed with him that they're sinners, and that they needed a Savior, and they've received Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. This was the problem of the Pharisees. They never agreed with God that they were sinners. They condemned people that they called sinners. But God condemned all of them. And possibly of the 6,000 that lived during the time of Jesus, there's probably only three of them that ever got saved that we know of from Scripture. One, the most well-known of all was Saul of Tarsus, who was the son of a Pharisee, and he was a Pharisee. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when he had the conversation with Jesus and Jesus told him you must be born again. Your religion won't get you into heaven. And how many people today on planet earth are dependent on their religion to get them into heaven? There's a whole lot of them. A whole lot of them. They go to churches every Sunday and they won't get into heaven. They'll end up in hell because they did not believe God's word and received Jesus as they say. They became religious. They joined the church. They got baptized. They took communion. They did all of these things. They helped people. But you see, none of that will get anybody into heaven. And yet, that, mute, that message is constantly being promoted by Satan's ministers. Do good. Live a good life. God will accept it. That's a lie from Satan. You can't do enough good to please God. Why? Because all of us have a corrupt, sinful nature. Everybody. That's why you never have to teach children how to do wrong. Uh, uh, Rebecca? R Rebecca? Yes, yes. Re I got it right. <laughs> yes. Rebecca, you ain't spending no time teaching her now how to do wrong. wrong. Uh, that girl look at you and, no. Mine. No mommy. And all the rest of us parents know all about that. Because our kids told us the same thing. No, mine. Especially if they had a sibling. Mine. No. And, sorry, just to remind you all, I know y'all forgot. When we were kids, we did the same thing with our parents. No, mommy. No, I don't want to take a bath. No. No, mommy, I didn't eat that cookie. <laughs> no, I didn't take that cookie, mommy. See? You know how to teach kids how to do wrong? It's in, born in every person that's born into the planet. That's why everybody needs to be born again. Amen. Everybody. But you see, people who say they're Christian don't believe that. So they say, well, you know, God understands. No, God don't understand sin. He only does one thing with sin. He condemns it. Please don't walk around talking about God understands. No, sorry. You didn't get that from the Bible. You made that up. God don't understand wrong. He don't understand disobedience. He ain't just winking at it. He deals with it in his own time. Now, for those who are saved, who are believers, the will of God is recorded in the Word of God. God commands, demands, and expects all believers to do his will. Let me say it again. God commands, demands, and expects all believers to do his will. You and I have absolutely zero excuse for doing God's will. So what's the question on the floor? As a believer, do you do God's will? Well, let me give you a few examples of what God expects of us. All believers, God's will is that we make disciples, Matthew 28. That's why each week, we put the gospel track in there and say, pass it out to somebody this week. Because God expects all of us to make disciples. Now, we can't save anybody. You can't, and I can't either. 
Jonah 2.9, salvation is of the Lord. But God expects us to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. And this is how we're helping to facilitate here at the Carrollton Bible Church. Doesn't matter whether you've been to Bible college, whether you studied Greek or Hebrew, none of that has anything to do with anything. He said, he said, God said, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because you know the truth. What's the truth? Everybody that dies without Jesus is going to hell. I just went to a funeral yesterday. Young lady who knew Christ. And from what I understand, you all, some of you all knew her because she used to come here when she was a, a little kid in Iwana. 36 years old. She's gone. The, nobody has a guarantee on how long they're going to live. She got to 36. My sister made it to 50. My mother made it to 78. My dad made it to 72. Nobody has a guarantee. You don't, and I don't either. See, the worst thing in the world is not dying. The worst thing in the world is to die without Jesus. Amen. Because when you step from time into eternity, you're either going to heaven or hell. And that's permanent. You can say it, uh, dog Ann. I ain't got a problem. Talk to me. <laughs> Talk to me. But you see, that's the message we got to get out, and we can't ever forget that. You cannot act like this not true. Why is it urgent for you and I to share the gospel with others? Because see, it becomes very personal. Why? All of us have mother, sister, brother, cousin, niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, grandchildren, uh, and so forth that we love. We love these people. Listen, it, no matter how much you are Christian, if they haven't trusted Jesus, they're not a Christian. And if they die without trusting Christ, they're going to go to hell. That's your mother, brother, sister, cousin, niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, grandchildren. Are you praying for them? Have you shared the gospel with them? Don't tell me you love them and you won't tell them about Christ. Don't tell me you love them and you won't pray for them. Because you see, God's not playing a game. This is serious. It's so serious that God allowed Jesus to go through what he went through when he came to earth, to be crucified. Good Friday was a bloody mess. And he did it because he wanted to save us and to redeem us. And we've got to love people enough to share the gospel with them. We've got to be willing to... No, everybody's not Billy Graham, or uh, everybody is not a public speaker. No, that has nothing to do with nothing. See, we all have conversations with people that we know and love, and we know whether they know Christ or not. Listen, you got to bring Christ up at some point. You got to tell them about Jesus and what He did, and urge them to repent and trust Jesus as their Savior, because you really love that person. We ain't even talking about strangers. We're talking about people you know and love. Love them enough to share the gospel with them. Understand that God wants them to be delivered, and you should too. But you've got to share the gospel as a believer. As believers, God's will is that we congregate together. Hebrews chapter 10. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10. The Hebrew writers writing to these Christians, so-called, some of them were not legitimate, but they were going back on their faith, they were denying their faith, and they were dishonoring the Spirit of God. See, it's always been a mixed multitude. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, it was a mixed multitude. Some were genuine believers and others were not. So then the unbelievers got Aaron to build that calf. No believer would have done that. It's always been a mixed multitude, and so it is in the church today. You've got people who are believers and people who are unbelievers. And they come to church regularly. So here's what he says in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Why do we come to church regularly? God said come. He said, come together. Don't act like some people, as he said, who do this. He says, not for the second, assemble ourselves together. As is the manner of some, there's some people that are in and out. 
They're not faithful. They're not consistent. Listen, when you meet Jesus, he's not going to lie to you and say, well done, good and faithful servant, if you were unfaithful. And we got all kind of excuses. Sorry, probably going to irritate some people right now, but I'm just going to tell you the truth. I don't care who comes in town. I don't care what my grandchildren are doing. On Sunday, I'm coming to church. I'm coming to worship God. Sorry, no exceptions. God comes first. Comes first before my wife. Comes first before my grandkids. Comes first before my kids. And I became a part of this local church, and my commitment is to be here every Sunday because I love God. So I ain't staying home for no football game or no other kind of game. And if Carol and I go out of town, and we out of town on vacation, I find a church to go and worship in on Sunday. Because, see, my commitment to God is not just... When I'm here in my home church, whether I'm the pastor or not, my commitment is to God. And he said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as the matter of some is. So I don't come this Sunday and miss next Sunday. I don't hit and miss. I don't do that to God. <coughs> Sorry. That's a violation of what he said. <coughs> but most people, you know God understands. No, he don't. No, he don't. He does not understand disobedience. He does not understand not faithfulness and uncommitted to him and being in and out and in and out. And he's not going to lie to you when he meets you. He's not going to tell you you were faithful if you weren't faithful. And look what he says as he ends the verse. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is he talking about? The day when we all going to meet the Lord. That day is, you know that day is a, a lot closer now? than it was at the beginning of this year. We are going to meet him. And none of us can offer an excuse. My wife, my husband, my children, whatever, whatever. No, 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 no. You claim that I was your Lord and Savior. Why were you not faithful? And really some rhetorical question because he already knows. You had other things that were more important to you. So people don't go to church. I, I got to cut my lawn. I got I to gotta wash my car. I got to paint my house. I got to whatever, whatever, whatever. Well, the lights are saying amen. <laughs> See, we got to be serious about our commitment to God. It's not hit or miss. He didn't hit and miss with providing salvation. Oh, well, you know, I'm tired of hanging up here on the cross. I think I come down. Maybe I, I might go back up there. No, he was committed all the way. And you and I, he called us to be committed all the way. Is the Christian life easy to live? No, it's difficult. It involves sacrifice, just like Jesus sacrificed to provide salvation. It involves telling people no because you have a commitment to God. And you can't love people more than you love God. Jesus said, if you put mother, father, sister, daughter, a son, grandchild above me, you cannot be my disciple. Listen, you've got to be all in with Jesus. He has to be the central person in your life. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means that I'm committed to Christ. I've been in prayer meetings where I was the only person at the prayer meeting. Because I was committed to coming together and praying. I was a part of a church. We met on Wednesday night. It didn't matter to me that nobody else showed up. The pastor was out of town. But nobody else came. Well, the pastor's out of town, so I ain't coming. But your commitment not to the pastor. Your commitment is to Christ. And I stayed there the entire time. The prayer meeting was from 7 to 8.30. And I stayed there and had a prayer meeting with Jesus till 8.30. Because that's the commitment I made. As believers, God's will is that we meet for prayer. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. Please. And here's what it says in verse 40 of Acts 2. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued, this 3,000 continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. They came together to be taught the word of God. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have men's meeting. That's why we have Bible study on Wednesday night. So you can continue in the apostles' doctrine. What's more important to you? 
Yeah, I get tired on Wednesdays too. You work all day, you don't want to come, but listen, you made a commitment. So they continued in the doc, the uh, apostle doc, and fellowship. Part of what we do in the men's ministry is fellowship. We have a half an hour fellowship before we have Bible study. The point is so that we can get to know each other, so we can pray for one another, encourage one another in the faith to keep going on with Jesus. That's why we come together. You just come together and take up your time on Saturday. I got a lot of things I could be doing on Saturday morning too, like sleeping. Okay? But no, this Saturday I'll get up at 8 o'clock and I'll leave the house at 8.30 to come here to fellowship with the men of this church and any other men that want to come. Because we need to fellowship. You can't make it in the Christian life by yourself. No matter whether you're the pastor or a, a person that don't have any position in the church. You can't make it by yourself. You need the fellowship of the saints. That's why we come together. That's why that ministry was put forth. So the men can come together and grow stronger. Because God wants strong male leadership in the church. And you know what? You don't trust nobody you don't know. That's why you got to spend time with people. And so we grow a strong church because the men get together and know each other. And then we expect the women to follow. Women don't want to follow men that ain't going nowhere, don't know what they're doing. You know, it's like when you met your wife. Honey, get on my bus. She want to know where you're going. She want to be driving around in circles. But now, ladies, when you get on the bus, you ain't supposed to be trying to take the driver's seat away from them. Okay? You know, kick, kick them to the curb and say, let me drive. No, sorry. That's not the order that God designed. Sorry. In the breaking of bread, we're going to do that in a few minutes. We're going to remember the Lord. Why do we come on first Sunday? Because we remember the Lord. So I especially make sure I'm on first Sunday. Why? Because we're remembering the Lord. Why are we doing that? He said do it. It don't matter whether anybody else show up or not. He said do it. I'm here. Because I want to obey God. I want to do God's will. I want to please God. And I love God. That's my motivation. And in prayers. Why do I come on Wednesday night? You know, I can stay home. John Thrift's teaching the Bible study. I don't need to come. I'm not the teacher. I'm the pastor, but I'm not the teacher. Big deal. John Thrift's leading the Bible study, and right after the Bible study, we had prayer. And so I come because the Bible is being taught. Yeah, I might be the pastor, but I can learn something. Or well, I can be reminded of the truth. So I come to the Bible study. And I come for the prayer time because I know the importance of praying one with another. Here's what he said they did. They prayed together. You can't pray and you're not together. But the prayer meeting is the most least attended uh, uh, part of any church. And you find out who the people who are really committed to God because they come to prayer meeting. Because there ain't no glamour in coming to prayer meeting. Sunday is glamour. You know, it's Sunday. People are out there. It's the, it's the thing to do. But see, Wednesday is, I'm really committed because I'm tired. I've worked all day. Uh, I've been wrestling with this and that and up. But I'm, I know I need to pray. And so I'm at prayer meeting. And uh, Mr. Dow, can you think of your first name? Gary. Gary. See how old I got? Gary will tell you that one of the things that was unique about that church in the late 70s, that the people who came to Sunday church, they came to prayer meeting. And it was just so tremendous a church that Satan had to get in there and blow the thing up. But that, it was a dynamic church because we came together on Sunday, we came together on Thursday night and had Bible study and prayer. And 99% of the people that came on Sunday were there on, am I, am I telling the truth, Gary? They were there. It was a dynamic church. We started a Christian school in D.C., one of the first to be started. This little small church. Because it was a dynamic church. We had a radio broadcast. This was a was impacting people throughout. We were doing evangelism all throughout Washington, D.C. Because it was a dynamic church. See, God don't need a lot of people. He just needs some people that are committed. That's all he needs. And we were all committed. Because we had a leader who was committed. And he preached that. He instilled that in us. And we were young. And, and we were out there doing the will of God. Sharing the gospel with people. Because we love the Lord and we were committed to doing the will of God. 
Secondly, the will of man. God's will for the post-flood people to fill the, fill the earth. Uh, God's will was for the post-flood people to fill the earth, but that was not what men wanted to do. They said repeatedly in these nine verses, let us. First of all, they said, let us make brick. You see, there was no stone where they were to build, so they made brick and baked them, showing uh, their creativity and their ingenuity. They said, let us build a city and a tower. They wanted to build a city to live in and a tower to reach the heaven, the story tells us. But they did it because they wanted to make a, to, to make, um, a name for themselves. And the fear that they had was of being scattered um, over the face of the earth. And this was in direct opposition to the will of God. Man continues to oppose the will of God for his own will and desire. Men uh, will to make a name for themselves and will do anything to accomplish that. Now, Nimrod, who we met in chapter 10, were, may have been the leader of the effort to build the city and the tower. Since Genesis 10 tells us that his kingdom included the founding of the city of, of Babel, Eric, Akkar, and Calvin in the land of Shinar. Shinar, first mentioned in Genesis 10.10, 10, was a plain in the lower Euphrates Tigris system, and an area that today is identified from modern Baghdad to the Persian Gulf. Interestingly, the last mention of Shinar in the Old Testament is in Daniel 1-2, which says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his, that is, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. You see, the Tower of Babel was most likely a ziggurat, a common structure, structure at one time in Babylonia, um, most often built as a temple. Ziggurats look like pyramids with steps or ramps leading up the sides. Ziggurats stood as high as 300 feet and were often just as wide. Thus, they were the focal point of the city. The people in the story built their tower as a monument to their own greatness, something for the whole world to see. For they desired to make a name for themselves, as the text and the story tells us. It was a monument to the people and not to God. Building both the city and the tower were evidence of man's will and not God's will. Today, men still seek to exert his will over God's will. Today, men defy God by rejecting his will for, uh, for theirs. So today, men worship other so-called gods other than the true and living God. Just look up and down Good Hope Road and around some of the corners that are off of Good Hope Road. And uh, we will see different places of worship. They are not dedicated to the worship of the God of the Bible. They are places of worship, like the Buddhist temple uh, um, across the street. It's not dedicated to worship of the God of the Bible, like the Jehovah Witnesses, who are false witnesses of God down the street and around the corner. And then the two Hindu temples within a close proximity. They are not dedicated to the worship of the God of the Bible. Look at some of the laws of the land, which express man's will, not God's, like the legalization of abortion and same-sex marriage, both of which are in direct opposition to the revealed will of God expressed in the word of God. So what does God do when mankind exerts his will over God's will? God brings judgment. Our final point, the wrath of God. The story of the dispersion is the story of God's judgment falling upon man for exerting his will over the will of God. God told the post-flood people, be fruitful and multiply. They did that. And to fill the earth. They did not do that. They defied God and stayed together and built a city and a tower. 
So God came down and saw what men were doing. And God determined to confuse the languages of mankind. This resulted in men being scattered over the face of the earth, just as God had told them to do. We must remember Daniel 4.35, spoken by Nebuchadnezzar, who uh, would, was the king of Babylon at a later time than the story we're looking at in Genesis 11. He said this, and I quote, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? End quote. No one, Nebuchadnezzar was saying, can oppose God's will and be successful. No one can stop God from carrying out his will. The old Ralph Brown commercial, no one. Or nobody, he used to say. Some of y'all not old enough to remember that. I know you are. You're older than me, so don't be sitting back there like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Ralph Brown commercial, nobody. Well, no one can stop God from carrying out his will. NCBC, we need to commit ourselves anew to doing God's will. God's wrath falls on all who fail to do his will. Every time, every time you hear someone speak what to you is a foreign language, it should be a reminder of the judgment of God on mankind for their failure to do the will of God. God said disperse. They all spoke the same language. And since they didn't do what God said, he changed the language. That's why we have all the languages in the world today. It wasn't because people grew up separately and they learned different languages. No, 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 no. Genesis 11, 1. Please look at it one more time. Look at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Everybody spoke the same language. I believe that's what will happen when we get back to heaven again. Because there won't be any rebellion going on in heaven. The fact that people speak French, German, English, and whatever language you want, because we don't know what Adam and Eve spoke. Okay? But the fact that they are all these languages, that's a reminder of this event, Genesis 11. And it's a reminder of God's judgment on man. And now we've got to spend years trying to learn French, German, English, Italian, or whatever else you're trying to use to communicate with somebody. But every time you hear a foreign language, you should be reminded of the judgment of God. Because see, God will not have his will thwarted. He intended for them to be scattered over the earth, and that's exactly what happened. Because they couldn't talk to each other. And so they called the place Babel, which means confusion. And later it became built as a city that Nebuchadnezzar would rule over. So let us who claim Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as our God, let us determine by the grace of God to do the will of God for the glory of God. Then and only then will we be, will we be blessed of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word and the story of the dispersion. We understand that it, this happened just as the flood happened because men failed to do the will of God. And one day the tribulation is coming because men fail to do the will of God. They fail to repent of their sins and trust Christ as their Savior. Oh Lord, that day of judgment is coming. The wrath of God will be revealed on heaven and many people will suffer. But Lord, we thank you that we can escape the wrath of God because Romans 8, 1 says, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I pray that each one in this congregation today and those who would listen to this message by way of our website and the internet would repent of their sins and trust Jesus as their Savior, that they might escape the wrath of God. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he died, was buried, and rose again. Thank you that we have life in him, we who have repented of our sins and trusted Jesus as our Savior. We bless you and praise you now in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> We're so, I'm so glad to see Gary. Stand up, brother. <laughs> Got old. Oh, well, let's all stand and be prepared. And uh, uh, continue to rejoice with Rebecca. All the work's done. She's waiting for those grades. Amen. And uh, we're going to have a hallelujah, good shouting time next May uh, when she graduates from the University of Maryland.
Howard University. I don't know why you said that. Girl. You know she don't go to Howard University. Howard University with a degree in chemistry. Wow. And a minor in biology. Well, don't let her experiment on you trying to find out what's inside of you. You better watch out. Lock your door at night. I like MD material. MD material. Yeah, that's right. That's what she was doing. Well, let's pray. And uh, 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 Elizabeth, how you doing? All right, black hat lady today. All right, we're praying for you and your family. Doris, you doing well? All right, friend. Doc Ann, I see you doing well. You're just jumping up and down. <laughs> Golly, putting all of us to shame in <laughs> Doc Ann's aerobic class will start immediately after the service. <laughs> That's right. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for members of New Carrollton Bible Church. Thank you for Gary visiting with us today. Bless him, his mom, his sisters, their entire family. Uh, continue to bless Elizabeth and her family. Uh, bless... Uh, Doris and her family. Uh, bless each one. Bless the family. Pray for Sydney, who's away after having sung two concerts yesterday. Bless her, help her to recover and return home uh, and to be with her husband, John. Uh, thank you for the Nathan family. Bless them. And, and the Camacho family. Bless them. And, and uh, uh, just bless each family here today. Bless uh, uh, Re Rebecca, Rochelle, um, uh, Naya. Deborah, Luther, uh, bless their family and all the members of it. Again, uh, bless Keith and Doc Ann and, and just bless everyone here, I pray in Jesus' name. Be with us as we leave. Amen. God bless you as you go. Hey.